Thank you very much, Barakat, and thank you all for joining this uh, lecture. It's a pleasure to be here and to visit the Water Institute, in part because it's so close. I'm just down the road at McMaster, and uh, I am pleased to see many familiar faces and look forward to making additional connections that we can build on in the months and years to come. So thank you again, Barakat, and thank you to Kevin and the Water Institute uh, for the invitation. Today, I am going to tell you a story of three iconic rivers the Colorado, the Columbia, and the Murray Darling, confronting a common challenge, how to share scarce and variable freshwater across the competing needs of cities, farms, energy production, indigenous communities, and the ecosystems that support them all. These are three international examples in advanced economies confronting what David Gray and Claudia Sadaf have described as difficult hydrology arid and semi-arid conditions, as well as the variability associated with those conditions. And during the talk this afternoon, I'm going to share lessons from about a decade of research in the field investigating how water markets and transboundary basin governance institutions have been used with varying levels of success in these three cases to address that challenge. And overall, I'm going to make one argument which is that water markets have a potentially important role to play in building flexibility and adaptive capacity, but they are the servant of sound governance and not the master. They require substantial and sustained investment in institutional development, both water rights reforms and collaborative governance at multiple scales to build this flexibility and capacity. And I want to start these stories in talking about my entry point into the discussion, which was in 2004. Uh, I got started in the Colorado River, and on the title slide here, you can see an aerial photo of one of the major storages serving the lower Colorado River system in southwest U.S. and northern Mexico. And what you see pictured on the title slide is the rapid depletion experienced by Lake Mead, uh, that storage, uh, during the drought conditions that have been underway un during an unprecedented sequence of dry years since about 2000 until present day. And like Apollo looking back at the Earth and transmitting the image of one blue planet, this rapid decline was a major focusing event in the Colorado River. Ostensibly due to drought, but also the consequence of a structural deficit in which there's a chronic imbalance between supply and demand that depletes storage even in dry years, I became interested and how to adapt to this rapid change in dealing with scarcity, variability, and competing needs in the basin. So in 2005, shortly after this rapid decline had become evident, after doing some exploratory research, I visited a member of my PhD committee, and I said, I'd like to understand how market mechanisms can be used to address these challenges, and particularly how those mechanisms can be used to restore the delta at the end of the Colorado River system in Mexico which had received a fraction of its uh, historic water supplies and had become depleted. And I was told two things. One, it's the most overstudied problem in the world. And two, it's hopeless. For those of you who've been following this story in the Colorado River, you'll know that last year in April of 2014, a coordinated pulse flow was delivered to the Colorado Delta using a combination of market mechanisms organized by local farmers in Mexico, as well as an international agreement between the US and Mexico to coordinate reservoir deliveries to provide the flood pulse needed for that ecosystem. So it shows that change is possible. It also shows that market mechanisms can play a role if combined with strong governance at multiple scales. But even in 2005, I wasn't able to tell that story. So what I was interested in doing is understanding first within the western U.S. and then later in southeast Australia in the Murray-Darling Basin, what are the pathways to water security? What role can market mechanisms play? What explained the emergence, the evolution, and performance of water markets, where they had taken hold, and what could be some lessons to provide back to the Colorado River? So the rest of this uh, presentation, I'm going to share that journey and the results of a book project which was pictured on the previous slide called Water Allocation and Rivers Under Pressure, looking at water trading, transaction costs, and transboundary governed institutions in the Western US and Australia. I'm going to talk about five main points. Uh, the first is this concept of river-based enclosure, 
popularized initially by Francois Moll, describing conditions when downstream conditions, downstream uh, demands are not being met as a wicked problem in a large-scale commons dilemma, which helps us frame the problem in a way we can understand the potential solutions, and particularly the solutions related to water markets and water allocation reform. The second main point I'm going to focus on is how to build flexibility adaptive capacity through markets in a world of positive transaction costs. Uh, transaction costs are something that we all experience every day, waiting in line at the supermarket to buy some goods, uh, with water, they're particularly high because of the complexity of allocating the resource, the public and private values at stake. I'm going to talk about trying to make transaction costs visible, incorporating those into our analysis of policy change and performance. And then I'm going to walk through three case studies. First, the experience in the Colorado River, one of unlocking the past and overcoming some of the restrictions imposed by historic institutions and technologies that have created vested interests, irrigation communities which stand to lose a great deal in this transition and therefore resisting the changes um, that uh, are associated with water markets and some transboundary governance reforms. I'm then going to talk about the local innovations within parts of the US portion of the Columbia Basin where markets have emerged particularly to reallocate water from irrigation to environmental flows needed for salmon habitat. And then finally, going to consider the experience of the Murray Darling, which is well known as the most advanced water market in the world, but also in parallel has invested in basin governance reforms, some more successful than others, which have been needed uh, to scale up and to achieve sustainability and flexibility at the basin level. I want to uh, argue that these two regions, the western US and Australia, are at the leading edge of a global challenge with water scarcity and climate variability. And here, what you see is that global context as represented by the OECD and its environmental outlook last released in 2012, which projects that in 2050, under baseline conditions, almost 4 billion people will live in water-stressed river basins. If you pay close attention to these comparisons between 2000 and 2050, you'll notice that some areas are actually projected to reduce their stress. And the Colorado River and the Murray Darling are two of those examples. And they're examples because they've got a common set of challenges, which I've pictured here, related to competition between and within sectors. When I talk about sectors, this is for agriculture, for cities, for ecosystems, for energy, for different water needs. There's condition of climate variability and change, prolonged droughts, periodic floods, and projected uh, increasing impacts of climate change. The structural deficit of overallocation leading to unmet environmental needs and degradation. And these are large systems. Uh, the Murray Darling is about 1 million square kilometers. I think that's roughly the size of Ontario. We always use those kinds of translations, but it shows you the the extent and the complexity of dealing with these large systems, and in particular, the challenges of working across political borders where there's independent authority uh, to address uh, water within the boundaries. And these, these regions are at the leading edge also because they've chosen a common set of policy options to respond, which is a broad, broadly speaking, a cap and trade water allocation system, establishing a limit on water access and then tradable water rights uh, to allocate water, uh, both when the rivers are developed, but in particular uh, as water needs and values change and uh, reallocation becomes necessary, the market and the use of uh, willing seller, willing buyer transactions is considered a potential solution to build flexibility and adaptive capacity. So I'm going to talk about river basin closure. <coughs> And I'm going to describe this as both a wicked problem and a large-scale commons dilemma. What you see uh, here is the first of the cases, the Colorado River, where there is the flows that are being delivered downstream of Hoover Dam, the dam that creates Lake Mead as the reservoir. Uh, since the dam was constructed in, the Hoover Dam was constructed in the 1930s. And what you see from pers the perspective of the delta, the downstream needs have been, downstream need of the delta have been uh, reduced markedly since that reservoir filled in the 1930s. And from a river basin closure perspective, 
arguably that is uh, the time frame when the river basin became closed uh, for, for environmental needs. It's a wicked problem, however, because arguably this concept of river basin closure can be framed in terms of multiple downstream needs, not only the environment, but those of cities and farms. And the nature and causes of this uh, down, uh, river basin closure are in dispute. And, uh, and the solutions involve unintended consequences, which are characteristic of wicked problems and create uh, challenges of reversing course or changing course as you learn more information about the problem. This is a large-scale commons dilemma as well because it's difficult to access new users from using the river. Uh, groundwater use, surface water use, these uh, are limited renewable supplies and there's a potential for a commons dilemma because it's difficult to exclude people from accessing the resource, it's depletable, and over extraction can lead to over harvesting and collapse, collapse in watershed function, a subsidence that impacts groundwaters and their ability to renew themselves, and uh, therefore it becomes a, a specific challenge of collective action, of trying to solve the boundary problems of limiting access and then dealing with allocation uh, among those who have access to the resource. Um, and what I encourage you to consider is this picture as an EKG of the Colorado River. And um, the awareness of this challenge has been great for decades, but has become into sharp relief during the drought. So uh, what you see on the top slide was that reservoir depleting, and over the period from 2000 to 2014, you have a, a sharp reduction in reservoir levels. Uh, just a, uh, an estimate here that as of September 2015, the Lake Mead is, uh, sorry, the Colorado River system storage, not just Lake Mead, but the entire Colorado River system storage is half full or half empty, depending on your perspective. But over the 15 years of uh, unprecedented dry years, um, the reservoir storage um, has provided a buffer in capacity uh, for many of the downstream users in cities and farms that require reliable supplies. That's changing from the perspective of uh, river basin closure, as you see that sharp um, decline in reservoir storage on the top, um, with the recognition that this structural deficit, the chronic supply and demand imbalance, has reached important thresholds. I'm going to emphasize briefly two. The first uh, is pictured in the late 1990s, where long-range supply and long-range demand intersected for the first time. And then during the early years of the current drought or sequence of dry years, uh, you see long-term demand eclipsing supply. And I emphasized at the outset that even in normal years, the structural deficit leads to downstream deliveries that exceed the inflows. And, and that's to say that the reservoir levels will decrease even in normal years because the river is overcommitted. So you see that this is a wicked problem because it is caused by multiple inter enters uh, acting factors, and the root cause is overallocation. Now looking forward, one point to take away from this is that a basin study was conducted over the period from 2010 to 2012, and you see projections of supply and demand. And in the context of climate change, you see a great deal of uncertainty about future supply, but you see a, more certainty about demand, projected increases in demand. And from the perspective of a cap and trade allocation system, you actually haven't established a cap. This isn't surprising in the Colorado River. Extensive interbasin diversions have uh, used the water from the Colorado River to support cities that exist formally outside of the basin boundaries, cities like Los Angeles and Denver. And so, um, therefore, a fundamental reckoning with this era of limits has yet to uh, occur. So, in the context of the advice from my PhD committee, this was one of the most overstudied problems in the world, and it was hopeless. Um, I traveled to the Columbia Basin, which I like to think of as a land of milk and honey. It's a place of particularly in um, Oregon and Washington, tremendous environmental movement, commitments, a um, grassroots organizing um, to establish in stream flows, to incorporate integrated management into water governance. And um, many times when I mention that I went to the Columbia Basin, people become surprised because think of it as a land of abundance, much like many parts of Canada. And that would certainly be true if you were focusing on the area west of the Cascades, um, pictured from this aerial photograph here. But it's clear when you move interior to in the interior portion of the basin, where 
many of the tributaries exist, that these are semi-arid or arid environments, irrigation regions in which some of these same chronic imbalances occur at a, in a microcosm. These tributaries are closed. Many times don't connect with the main stem or with larger tributaries. And so you actually have many watersheds within the Columbia Basin where innovations had been attempting to incorporate water markets and market transactions into restoration of the river. This is a picture of the river basin closure, the tributary closure and uh, examples of the uh, Columbia Basin and the, the Chutes River, uh, which is in central Oregon and some of the other um, watersheds within uh, the Columbia Basin. You have situations under the prior appropriation system of water allocation based on the principle of first in time, first in right, where the physical availability of water is the limit, is the cap. And the full annual renewable flows um, are allocated in some months. And this is picturing that circumstance in late August when in one tributary, you have almost three times the water allocated than exists in average years. So the residual claimant becomes the environment and you have the chronic dewatering which has caused impacts for salmon fisheries and migratory fishery that uh, is iconic within the basin for its ecological, economic, and cultural importance. And then finally, uh, this condition of river basin closure manifests in different form, um, but at a large scale in the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, the mouth of the Murray-Darling at the end of the river um, has experienced steady declines in um, outflows over the period of development, which is represented on this chart with the stair-stepping of cumulative storage that has been developed over the 20th century, and then the bands, uh, the average uh, outflows during periods within that development era, leading to the most recent period in the late um, 1990s, and particularly during 2000s of the millennium drought, where the um, river no longer reached the sea in 2002, and you had a sharp decline in outflows, um, which impacted uh, the uh, ecosystem and um, upstream uh, demands for environmental wetlands. So three regions, common challenge of river basin closure, and common in terms of a wicked problem where it's not simply drought, but it's the interaction of droughts, demand, and development which have created these downstream impacts. So how to respond? Um, tends to be a focus on two panaceas, cure-alls, blueprints that have been um, used to respond to these conditions of scarcity and variability, um, but two responses that have been frequently considered in isolation, water markets and river basin governance. Um, in very brief terms, uh, the definition of these uh, two responses, water markets, a situation of willing buyer and willing seller transactions based on the idea of voluntary and compensated reallocation using price signals to cue shifts in water use from relatively low economic value um, water uses to relatively high economic value water uses and keeping a very um, important focus on the term economic and the analysis of reallocation. Uh, institutional elements of water markets are based on establishing a cap, um, recognizing scarcity and the limits of renewable water supplies allocating tradable rights, and then establishing trading rules uh, to govern the reallocation of those rights. And the performance of markets is shaped by politics and contest of values associated with water, as well as the transaction costs incurred in reallocating that water. Uh, someone's calling for a trade right now, apparently. Um, and the, uh, the point that I would make here is that each of these factors, politics and transaction costs are uh, symptoms of underlying technological, institutional, cultural values, and they help give us a lens for examining and engaging those issues. The second uh, response, of course, has been the effort to account for the interactions within basins, these ecological and hydrological connections which create social and economic interdependencies. What economics, economists will talk about are the externalities of our water use. And in that account of those connections, the focus on river basins as a unit for planning and operations of um, the river system, and the need to build horizontal coordination between different stakeholder groups at different scales, and then vertical coordination between different tiers of government. 
And likewise, the efforts to integrate uh, river basin and water management have been constrained or shaped by politics and transaction costs such that this integration remains elusive in many cases. And so what you'll see here is um, this term transaction cost coming up and came up very regularly during my field work in the Columbia Basin as the reason why water markets had faltered or been more difficult than anticipated. So this is represented quite well. We're in the context of droughts uh, and the impacts of droughts in places like California where uh, the attention from the media, the attention from policymakers has been increasing. And in the New York Times last summer in 2014, series of essays about what we're going to do about it. And the idea was with every drought comes a resurging interest in water markets. Uh, this quote was taken from Ellen Hannock, the uh, California Institute for Public Policy, who's been working on water markets in California, among other, uh, other water management and water governance issues in California for some time, and described the challenge as the system being clunky. It's often difficult to get approvals and protections are not always effective. We will need to develop a more streamlined approach while taking into account the fact that water market is more nuanced than, say, a market for plywood. And how and when water moves through the system matters. So the rules are needed to facilitate this trading while also balancing that trading with um, protections for the environment and for other users. Another version of this, um, this experience was represented in this quote where we're talking about water rights transfers would increase the benefits gained from the use of water and would tend to delay or make unnecessary the construction of new sources of supply. But the fact that no two water rights are identical, they're like snowflakes basically, would prevent the development of a market in water rights comparable to the auction market of a stock or commodity exchange. And I use this quote without attribution to make the dramatic point, which is that these were the findings of the US National Water Commission in 1973 in a report examining the future of water policy in the US and positioning water transfer centrally. So 40 years later, in many places where markets are perceived to have a role, we are still waiting for the future to arrive. And one of the reasons why more recently efforts to establish markets um, have been uh, uh, achieving more success is because they're accounting for the inevitability of transaction costs, the need for strong sound governance as the master for these markets. And my work was motivated by trying to make transaction costs visible, embrace the world of positive transaction costs, which the Nobel laureate Ronald Coase, uh, one of the key people originating ideas associated with transaction costs and natural resource allocation said, is simply the real world. And so by making transaction costs visible, it gives us analytical perspective and tools to understand more complex environmental challenges in which there are large and diverse groups of users. And so we might expect transaction costs to be comparably high. In studying how market mechanisms were being applied to common pool water resources of the American West, I was particularly drawing on the insights about the commons and collective action that were generated by Eleanor Ostrom and colleagues since responses to the provocative thesis by Garrett Hardin on the tragedy of the commons in 1960. And coupled this with a stream of research um, building on the ideas of a Nobel, another Nobel laureate, um, Oliver Williamson, who had been examining governance arrangements that minimize transaction costs and the kind of organizational innovations that were being used um, to respond uh, to transaction costs and minimize those costs. And when I was finishing up my uh, PhD research in 2009, I was naturally thrilled to wake up um, in October of that year to find that the, P the Nobel uh, Commission had recognized these two uncommon bedfellows as sharing a common foundation uh, for their extension of the work by Ronald Coase. And the simple insight that they shared was this idea that all transactions have costs, but these costs will be minimized by different institutional arrangements in different situations, which is to say that context matters and that there will not be a panacea, and certainly not an expectation that markets will work in every condition. And if they are to work, what other kinds of supporting institutions will be necessary? So for water, this can be pictured in a simple plot, which I've provided here, but uh, will uh, not belabor in too much detail, which just gives you 
um, the idea of two farms with an equal division of water but higher marginal productivity in one of the farms. And the idea that the reallocation from the farm with lower productivity to higher productivity or lower marginal productivity to higher marginal productivity will be constrained by the transaction costs incurred by both. Now this is represented by two neighboring farms. Imagine what we're dealing with when we're talking about across sectors, across distances, across public and private values, and you get to recognize that transaction costs are here to stay. We need to move into that world as Coase and these other thinkers had urged us to do. Um, naturally, it's important to talk about what are transaction costs. Transaction costs have been defined from relatively narrow to relatively broad perspectives, and I won't take too much time to outline each. Um, other than to say uh, that transaction costs are associated with collective action, how we organize ourselves to achieve common goals. Transaction costs are associated with defining, managing, trading property rights. And transaction costs are associated with changing the institution's governing allocation. And we might think of transaction costs as nested, in which buying and selling water is situated within a whole range of other reforms associated with creating market enabling frameworks and those um, situated in turn in the wider institutional context shaped by historical, technological, and cultural factors. Um, and these, um, these perspectives on transaction costs as nested um, naturally encourage us to focus on the importance of change and the importance of institutional change in enabling and constraining markets to achieve um, the goals of flexibility, adaptive capacity within the boundaries of socially acceptable trade-offs. And so wanted to make the argument, of course, um, that it would be possible uh, to use transaction costs as a new analytical perspective on water allocation reform, on river basin governance, and how the water markets and river basin governance have interacted to shape the trajectories in these three rivers we'll be talking about today. And I've argued that markets are the servant of sound governance, not the master, and therefore markets we would expect to depend on substantial and sustained investments in institutional development and change. And so here in this slide, I focused on how that change occurs or when we might expect it to occur in ways that can um, support the developments of markets. And this is a really simple calculus. Basically, we'd expect markets to form when the benefits of a rule change outweigh the costs. It's quite simple. but two things. First, we need to disaggregate the costs. We need to focus on the fact that costs include the cost of transactions within the prevailing institutional setting. The costs include the transactions, the, the transaction costs of setting up the market, both in the short term and the long term. And what I've argued is the, uh, the costs also include the deferred cost, the so-called intertemporal costs associated with past decisions that have impacts on our future flexibility, the impact of path dependency. And the takeaway, of course, of this calculus of institutional change is that in many cases, benefits being more than the cost is not sufficient. We have to account for the political economy of these and the distribution of these benefits and costs. The benefits may be concentrated and available to those with relatively high economic values. But the most important thing to consider is that the costs are often concentrated and localized, and therefore those who are impacted by these changes are likely to resist them. Um, I'll say briefly, I'm not going to go into too much of a methodological discussion, but is that in order to understand this calculus of institutional change, in order to understand the evolution and performance of markets in these three settings, it was necessary to actually open up the black box of transaction costs and use innovations in transaction cost measurement, transaction cost analysis um, to establish typologies of costs that can connect these broad concepts that I've mentioned with measurable quantities. And the basic analytic device for this is thinking about the transaction cycle and thinking about the policy or institutional reform cycle in which it's embedded and then identifying discrete phases or components of those cycles which can be measured. And using a variety of sources, what I like to think of as forensic accounting, field perspectives, the wisdom of practitioners um, in order to provide some sense of magnitude trends and factors explaining them. So I had uh, great support, particularly for my work in the Columbia Basin where I've done uh, the empirical analysis and quantification of costs uh, to do exactly this. I'll talk briefly about those findings in a moment. Um, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do for the rest of this discussion is focus on the stories and the lessons from the case studies. The first is a stop in the Colorado River um, where 
The key challenge, particularly when I began this research, was unlocking the past, overcoming a period of conflict and a, and a perspective that many of these challenges would be resolved in courts uh, to a situation in which markets, collaborative governance, transboundary governance institutions would work together to build flexibility into the system. What you see here is um, maybe not impressive, particularly in the, uh, the local environment and the water available for us here, um, but this is the leading edge of those, ex those pulse flows that were released in April 2014 to restore the delta, creeping back to the delta, reconnecting the river with its delta. It was an inspiring milestone and a rather uh, dramatic shift in focus over a 10-year period from 2004 when those declines became apparent uh, and 2012 when the agreement between the U.S. and Mexico provided for a, a pulse flow and 2014 when this was done amidst the continued and ongoing drought conditions. Uh, so uh, this was an inspired, inspiring milestone and it was enabled by a series of developments which have really could be taken from a textbook of uh, adaptive governance. And I wouldn't be surprised if the people who are, are the architects behind these reforms were reading those textbooks and trying to operationalize them within the Colorado River. What you see here is an excerpt with the original emphasis from the record of decision for interim guidelines to operate the reservoirs, uh, the main reservoirs, Lake Mead and Lake Powell in the Colorado River under different supply conditions, normal shortage surplus conditions. Believe it or not, until that period, rules only existed for normal conditions. And what they said, described is this unique and remarkable consensus emerging among the stakeholders within the basin. And it was one in which there was a focus on preserving flexibility to deal with the future challenges uh, by implementing operational rules for a long but not permanent period in order to gain valuable operating experience, the learning associated with adaptation, and to continue to have a federal government role that facilitates rather than dictates informed decision making. And the context here is important, which is that in 2004, when the need for these rules for shortage became apparent, initially the states, the uh, subnational government, governments within the Colorado River, um, got together because there was the threat that if they didn't, that the federal government would take over in the Secretary of Interior's role as river master for the Colorado. And so this gave, gives us a perspective on, on the importance of these principles of adaptation to unlock the past and to deal with the impacts of path dependency, which has often been described as a situation in which history matters, but in particular where historical choices about institutions and technology bind the past with the present, bind the past with the future by uh, shaping um, the potential for future change. And briefly, um, these sources of path dependency can be considered in terms of the vested interests who may resist change. Uh, many of the communities supported in the development, uh, the irrigation development area era have now been um, the, the, par the, par the partners and the parties needed uh, to deal with these changes to competition, to scarcity, to new values. So the irrigation communities were supported in one era and now um, need to be involved in uh, potentially some of the solutions dealing with climate variability and change. Network effects, which is to say these connections hydrologically and institutionally, mean that making changes in one part of the system have unintended consequences and therefore um, may uh, impose uh, restrictions. Second, uh, third, stranded assets. Many of the infrastructure investments are capital intensive and therefore making choices uh, to move on from a specific type of infrastructure irrigation infrastructure in particular um, may be difficult because of the need to maintain a critical mass for irrigation canals to reach their terminus, for efficiencies of various um, sorts to be established. And then not least, the one we think of regularly, property rights. These contractual agreements between water users and the government um, which create expectations and may lead um, to uh, uh, resistance to change. And the institutional choices historically were about how water rights are set up, how irrigation supply organizations um, are created um, to, in order to motivate capital investment and in infrastructure, and then how interstate apportionment agreements, the agreements of uh, water sharing, uh, are established between states or between provinces uh, who share the river. Important aspects of distributing the costs and benefits of the river before major investments are made in institutions and infrastructure. And then in the context of water markets, these institutional choices uh, are associated with establishing a cap or a limit uh, allocation uh, through 
uh, tradable rights and the trading rules governing their rights. Um, so I'll leave this point about unlocking the past, which is that the Colorado River and all three of the basins that I'll be talking about um, today um, have choices and that those choices have consequences for the future. And so one, in terms of unlocking the past, we need to understand the sources of path dependency, the sources of resistance to change, and engage those who are affected by it. And going into the future, we need to recognize that our solutions are temporary, the consequences are lasting. And in comparing these um, rivers, we can think of some major choices associated with the design of the cap, design of the allocation rules and the allocation and the trading rules, um, which can be contrasted between those that are uh, preserving flexibility and those that are likely to achieve more lock-in. And just on the order of setting the cap, we tend to think of setting the cap based on recognizing historic uses, grandfathering them in, and um, accepting that that may be unsustainable in the short term and making plans to transition off of it. Compared, though, to setting the cap based on um, adaptive limits and sustainable diversion limits, um, those historic uh, uses and those grandfathered caps are potentially going to lead uh, to more restrictions down the line because you have to deal with those vested interests who have now had their rights recognized. And uh, what I was interested in in the Columbia River Basin is how some of these sources of path dependency had been confronted um, to build innovation and flexibility. And uh, here, starting again with um, the perspective on the Columbia Basin, where there's been, uh, since 1980 in particular, a concerted effort to achieve integrated river basin management and salmon recovery, uh, mitigating the impacts of hydropower development on uh, the migratory salmon fishery. And this quote shows how these goals of comprehensive integrated management under a watershed-wide authority have achieved many accomplishments, but the two most sought after goals, salmon recovery and comprehensive management itself, have remained elusive due to the fact um, that there are politics, and those politics um, have uh, been associated with boundedly rational people struggling to achieve their goals in the face of transaction costs. And this manifests in ways where nonprofit and public programs designed to acquire water rights through market transactions and uh, re reallocate them from irrigation to environmental flow purposes um, have even had a situation where they've got money in the bank that they can't spend. And so this quote taken from the former board member of the Oregon Water Trust, one of the first private nonprofit organizations to uh, enter the market on behalf of the environment, um, had the bank balance of acquisition money remains quite healthy as it has been turned out, uh, turns out to be harder than expected to spend the money. Okay. So in fact, um, transaction costs in this case have limited um, the ability to use these innovations. And um, what I wanted to do is um, understand and examine uh, some of the um, lessons from places within the Columbia Basin where these challenges uh, had been addressed. So what I did was I set out to measure and explain the transaction costs in relation to other performance variables. The amount of water recovered, because that's the bottom line. If the goal is to restore salmon habitat through water recovery, we need to understand how transaction costs relate to delivering on that. And secondly, on the program budgets, the capacity overall for these um, programs uh, to cover the transaction costs, to cover the costs of uh, implementing uh, water transactions. And um, what I became interested in is assessing how those transaction costs, water recovery levels, and program budgets varied in relation to water rights reform and watershed governance institutions. So what you see here is the US portion of the Columbia Basin shared by four, uh, in most part shared by four US states, Oregon and Washington on the west, Idaho and Montana in the east. And uh, within those states focused on 13 watersheds in which transactional activity, wider recovery through market mechanisms had occurred during an initial implementation period uh, from 2003 to 2007 of an umbrella organization called the Columbia Basin Water Transactions Program, a public-private partnership uh, organized to mitigate the impacts of the Bonneville ba Power Administration in the hydropower system um, established within the Columbia Basin on salmon fisheries and using um, market mechanisms as one of the tools for doing so. So I worked closely with the practitioners within what they called qualified local entities working in these 13 watershed cases, uh, interviewed 
collected data from me meeting minutes and financial documents, and, um, con and, and, and accounted for the transaction costs associated with um, their water recovery and their water transactions. I operationalized this idea of adaptive efficiency, the notion that we can't think of efficiency of water allocation, efficiency of resource allocation in the short term, but need to look at it from a long-term perspective in the context of uncertainty, feedback effects, and complexity, in which paradoxically, achieving efficiency in the long term requires attention to other values, like in other objectives, like equity, sustainability, and adaptability. And operationalize this performance measure of adaptive efficiency as a circumstance in which you would have relatively high uh, levels of water recovery, relatively low or declining transaction costs, and sufficient capacity to cover the costs that are necessary in that context. So some high level lessons, of course, were that um, there were pockets of success in each of the four states within the Columbia Basin, which shows that even though the conventional wisdom and understanding of water allocation in Western US and for Western North America, for that matter, is vested in state authorities, is that it was the importance of local institutions on the ground able to implement those water rights systems um, needed in order uh, to uh, address transaction costs, uh, recover water for the environment, and build capacity over the long term. Uh, context matters, um, and we've probably heard that in many of the Water Institute talks that you've, you've been to, um, but it matters in ways in which the socioeconomic, institutional, physical characteristics are important but not determinative. determinative. They're important because they mean local institutions need to be in place to match the challenges in that context. But they're not determinative in the sense that you can't make a simple assumption that a given socioeconomic, institutional, or physical characteristic is likely to lead to higher or lower performance, which is to say many times we assume that places with physical characteristics of reservoir storage, homogeneous water rights, are actually going to have lower transaction costs. That's not automatically the case. And um, the same goes for some of these other characteristics. So performance varied based on the levels of local capacity and the vertical coordination in terms of rules at higher levels, financial capacity to supplement local resources and such. Um, another high level lesson, of course, was that crises matter and crises can be harnessed, um, particularly drought and land use change. In order um, to, of course, increase the benefits of these types of reforms and potentially decrease um, the costs associated um, with enacting water rights reforms based on governance reforms through new monitoring technologies um, that are originated during crises. And it's particularly interesting in the context of drought, which has also affected this region as in 2015, because in 2005 there was a drought year and you actually see that transaction costs decreased because some of the restrictions on water transactions were relaxed during that period or mechanisms were um, used such as water banks and other tools in order to streamline these programs. Um, but there's no organizational silver bullet. Um, there are three main types of organizations that tend to operate within the Columbia Basin. The, uh, nonprofit water trusts, place-based organizations that are quasi-governmental or quasi-governmental organizations like the Deschutes River Conservancy, and public programs like the states themselves uh, entering the market and working with landowners to implement these projects. Um, but it also emphasizes the need for a long-term perspective. And uh, given the uh, interest of time, I'm going to do this relatively briefly. Um, but I want to walk you through a contrast of four cases, which are uh, four watershed cases, uh, which are pictured on this map each of which during the period from 2003 to 2007 had a high level of water recovery. Each of which during the period from 2003 to 2007 had a relatively low levels of, of transaction costs. Um, but they had different levels of capacity in order um, to implement projects within the prevailing institutional framework within the region and also invest in the sustained and substantial um, reforms needed to scale up, things like building collaborative governance institutions that can deal with unintended consequences of trade, things like building water market, water banks, um, mitigation rules, other systems that would uh, a, a streamline these programs. And so high performance uh, in terms of water recovery and low transaction costs during this period, but divergent outcomes. Because when we take that snapshot of 2003 to 2007, disaggregate it and look at the annual trends from year to year, we see um, something quite interesting. Is that you compare the cases that were circled in green, the Deschutes River of Central Oregon, the Salmon River of Idaho, and we compare that with the two case studies in Western Montana, 
the Blackfoot and Bitterroot, and we see that uh, over the long term, that the annual, the average annual transaction costs are much lower in those and green, and um, that one of the uh, other aspects is that the range between the minimum and maximum transaction costs per year um, is much narrower for those in green. Why is that the case? Because these organizations took those program budgets and they didn't just, the, the organizations in the Deschutes or, uh, and the Salmon didn't just invest in doing deals and putting water into the river. They invested in building institutions. They invested in building governance and governance capacity to make the markets work in their local context. Whereas the examples in Western Montana focus mainly on plucking the so-called low-hanging fruit, getting deals that could demonstrate the potential of the market, but not simultaneously investing in governance, investing in making the water rights system work more effectively, investing in the collaborative governance institutions to deal with some of the complexities of a market for a resource with such important connections between the public and private values. In the interest of time, I won't take the um, time to unpack the analysis here, um, other than to say is that these trends then need to be linked back to governance arrangements, and institutional design and performance. And in this uh, plot here, examining the relationship between two dimensions, on the, ver on the horizontal dimension, water rights reform, and on the vertical dimension, water recovery where it basically captured the hypothesis that high levels of water rights reform are considered to be necessary, but not sufficient to achieve high levels of water recovery. The property rights need to be well-defined. They need to be tradable. There needs to be administrative capacity. If those conditions are in place, then um, it may be possible for markets to work in, achieve, in recovering water for the environment. It also may be possible during the early years of implementation to get a lot of water recovered without having those conditions in place. And you can see that quite clearly in the situation in Western Montana. Um, but what we have seen in this previous slide is that those trends after the period from 2003, when I extended the study to go to 2010, working with practitioners to develop a baseline analysis and a comparison between the phase between 2003 to 2007 and 2008 to 2010, you see the Western Montana cases hitting the wall. They're no longer incurring transaction costs because deals aren't happening. And of course, uh, this learning, and particularly the coordination mechanism of the Columbia Basin Water Transactions Program, gave those other case studies lessons about how they might be able to build um, capacity. And you see a lot of dynamism here, where um, if you were to take the same plot and compare it um, today, you'll see movement of some case studies. And what I'll highlight is in that second period of analysis, the upper Columbia, which is in that lower um, quadrant in the bottom left, has actually moved into the top right quadrant by investing in uh, water rights reform, collaborative governance. And so this shows that markets, um, making markets work require minimizing transaction costs of doing deals, but also investing in the transition costs of building governance institutions. So a very simple point, but demonstrated empirically with the evidence um, measured here. But if you're a salmon, local pockets of success are going to be a bit frustrating because you require basin connectivity. And so when I left the Columbia Basin finishing my PhD in 2010, I became interested in how do you scale up? What are the basin governance institutions that are needed in order to uh, scale up markets and to coordinate markets with basin planning and uh, systemic approaches to water governance? And so I looked to the Murray Darling, the last stop on this uh, tour, and I'm going to be very brief with it in which you had a grand experiment happening. Uh, and I know Bruce in the audience has had a chance to, uh, to learn from this experiment as well. Where the Murray-Darling Basin over a period of about three decades, I like to call the um, Murray-Darling uh, water markets the, the greatest 30-year overnight success because they had invested in these parallel processes of water rights reform, a cap and trade reform process, and basin governance. Um, particularly since the mid-1980s and the Murray-Darling Basin Initiative and some subsequent initiatives that build off of that. And in 2010, uh, it had been about three years since the new National Water Act had been established, the Commonwealth Water Act had been established in 2007, and along with it, a commitment uh, to a Water for the Futures program, including approximately $13 billion Australian dollars uh, to achieve a range of measures, including buybacks of water for the environment, using uh, the market mechanism to do so. So this is a situation in contrast with the Columbia Basin where you have emerging markets where markets are maturing. 
And they're maturing in part because of the coordination between the uh, developments in water rights reform and the basin governance institutions. Um, so scaling up to find, we can think of it in each of those institutional choices, the capping, the trading, the allocation, the trading, where um, water trade uh, scaling up looks like economic efficiency. There are gains from trade. Water rights are unbundled so that water can be separated from land. Trading rules are established so that water can move uh, relatively uh, flexibly between different water users. Uh, scaling up from the cap uh, includes audits of and monitoring of water use and establishing diversion limits, including diversion limits that uh, comply with our notions of sustainability. And then finally, scaling up for an environmental water recovery perspective occurs when many of these places, by definition, are encountering scarcity and overallocation. And so markets may not be implemented until the long-term sustainability has already been eclipsed by current demands, the situation we saw in the Colorado River. And so scaling up here means identifying environmental needs, acquiring water for the environment, and delivering that water for the environment, achieving adaptability. So some high-level lessons here. Um, and then I'll conclude with some specific lessons and uh, have a, a brief moment for questions before I have to dash back and teach. Um, first is that scaling up takes time, right? Um, and uh, that this is an analysis of the National Water Commission, this time in Australia, focusing on the phases of water policy in the Murray-Darling. You see that the origins of markets can be traced to European settlement, common law um, system, and the expansionary and development phase where you can find historical documents talking about the informal uh, trading and sharing of water between neighbors and the exchanges, um, the market-like exchanges which occurred uh, as early as the 19th century. But the concerted effort of reform um, occurred since the 1980s with the emergence, the broadening, and then the transition to sustainable markets. So scaling up takes time. Uh, and that is one measure of the transition costs and uh, transaction costs incurred. Scaling up is costly. Um, so this is a, a plot where we basically juxtapose two trends. Um, one uh, pictured in the uh, blue and red bars are trading activity. Uh, during roughly that period from the mid-1980s, um, which you see increasing uh, steadily in the, the 1990s. And after most of the policy and institutional infrastructure was established in the 1990s, the millennium drought occurred from late 1990s um, to uh, approximately 2009 when trading activity increased to provide flexibility and some headline statistics that I'll come back to in a moment with that. But in parallel with that, in the light green or gold um, and in the moving average represented by the black line, I've uh, disaggregated the federal expenditures in environmental water recovery through a series of major initiatives from 1990. And here you've got, this is a headline, this is a, a textbook case of correlation does not lead to causation, but you see a close relationship between increasing trading activity, increasing investments in this environmental water recovery from the federal government. What it shows is the paradoxical importance of uh, building institutions for water trading, but also maintaining and expanding capacity for basin governance. And what I would say is that the big challenge, and Bruce again will have had experience with this, is that these two need to be coupled and coordinated. They can't be done in, a, in isolation. And the results of them being uh, separated are evident in the rollout of what was called the Basin Plan, um, which was a comprehensive basin plan to establish sustainable diversion limits, to update the cap, the interim cap that had been established in the Murray-Darling in the mid-1990s based on sustainability criteria, involving a reduction of between 20 and uh, 27 and 35% um, of historic water uses in its first guide to the Basin Plan. And what you see here is uh, the reaction. Those vested interests, which I talked about so dryly earlier before, um, are now um, organizing as irrigation communities went to, to burn the plan. Finally, scaling up takes integration. Um, and this is a timeline uh, generated by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority itself, which is showing um, on the top panel a history of droughts and floods, and on the bottom panels um, the responses through air, uh, uh, infrastructure construction and management and policy reforms, which particularly since that 1980s period have been focusing on integrated basin governance. Um, I, if I had the time, I would talk about the fact that integration doesn't just mean that a federal authority is in place, but rather that there are a variety of integration mechanisms of uh, different scopes and authority, um, which can range from relatively single issue, uh, informal arrangements like working groups and informal networks, um, to 
comprehensive, multifunctional authorities like the Murray Drawing Basin Authority. And the argument is that these coexist, that there's a portfolio of formal and informal institutional arrangements, local and basin wide, which are needed uh, in order to build that integration. And uh, that lesson was learned through the rollout of the basin plan when it became evident that local communities needed to be involved. So some lessons. Um, first, that these integration mechanisms uh, require a portfolio and what would be, could be described as a polycentric governance system. So the main lesson is that the systemic risks associated with basin closure necessitate polycentric responses. And I examine these lessons in three main categories, performance, principles, and practice. So in terms of performance, um, these pictures here are associated with each of the rivers, the Colorado River, limited markets, but uh, extensive innovation, particularly recently, encouraging trajectory of river basin governance, a transformative pulse flow, but limits are elusive. There still hasn't been a fundamental reckoning with the need for limits. Um, in, the Col in the Columbia Basin, pockets of success where local capacity has uh, been established, and particularly the linkage between water rights reform and watershed governance. But the gap between the stronger and weaker case studies are expanding because of those um, who have only invested in transactions without building the institutions needed to scale up. And in the Murray-Darling, you have this wonderful success story of a market. Um, up to 40% of the water used in the Southern Connected Murray system has been traded in some years. Um, large scale recovery of uh, water for the environment and parallel and coordinated investment in water rights reform and river basin governance with um, the exception uh, to the rollout, associated with the rollout to the basin plan. In terms of principles, um, these are cross-cutting. Um, the need to embrace the three C's, complexity, context, and change, and therefore embrace transaction costs, realizing that transaction cost minimization is not really the point. Um, it's about building the governance capacity um, to achieve flexibility and adaptive capacity, and sometimes that costs. Um, and uh, the second main principle is the need in the context of path dependency and vested interests to recognize the legitimacy of those interests and build lasting coalitions for reform that strengthen coordination institutions that couple the market with collaboration, conflict resolution, and capacity. Um, and then third, a cross-cutting uh, principle related to designing for institutional diversity, realizing that the actual institutions that'll fit a given context are going to be matched to that local conditions and therefore can take different forms, but ones in which you focus on the principles of subsidiarity, building capacity at the lowest level possible, but no, low, no lower, and establishing complementary higher level institutions that can lower transaction costs, invest in resources, invest in the transitions um, that are going to be needed over time. In practice, um, Fundamentally, the Colorado shows us, and all of these cases show us, the need to recognize limits. Uh, the need to invest in transparent information, which helps us understand what those limits are and filter those through social choices and values. Um, the second practical issue I've mentioned already several times is to acknowledge and engage vested interests, uh, treat agriculture as a partner rather than an enemy, and that solutions will be temporary and consequences are lasting. So in the context of climate change, in the context of complexity, um, the need um, to build in that interim adaptive learning cycle that we heard about in the Colorado um, so that it's possible uh, to build capacity over the long term and not just in a snapshot in time. And then from my perspective, I think we need to learn from comparison and forge communities of practice, not just academic perspectives, but practitioners who are exchanging across similar contexts. What I also like to say, particularly when I'm in Australia talking about this, is how Elwood Mead himself the namesake for that reservoir spent uh, one of the first stints uh, directing the Victoria Water Supply and Rivers Commission in the early 1900s, learning from some of the perceived failures in the US in doing so, and then bringing back lessons when he uh, was Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner. And then building institutional memory associated with that, and getting to this middle ground between the idea that every case is unique versus their blueprints to the idea of the middle path um, where it's possible for broad principles to be adapted in different contexts. Um, lots of current work that's building on this, both in Australia and also some of my current work um, testing the conventional wisdom that I became interested in during the Murray Darlings transition about what does the federal role, what is the federal role during crises and droughts? What's the appropriate ways for coordinating local and central capacity and kind of using droughts as stress tests in North America as a laboratory to assess those relationships. And uh, I've had some good interactions with many people in the room already on this work. Um, 
So thank you. And uh, I have probably about five, five, seven minutes or so for some discussion. But to want to emphasize on the record that I was here last week. Um, and I'm just down the road. Um, so I see this as really the continuation of a longer conversation and collaboration. Thanks for your attention.